Following the defeat of the Nazis in 1945 after the Red Army's advance into Berlin, the Allied forces were still fighting the Japanese Empire, even well into the summer of 1945. Anti-Japanese resistance forces, the majority of which were led by communists, began popping up all over the Asian Pacific over the course of the Second World War, and they led their heroic struggles against the Japanese invaders as part of their fight for independence and national liberation. But there is one example of a struggle against Japanese colonialism that later transformed into a fight for national liberation against a US and a UN-led coalition of imperialist countries. This struggle for national liberation happened over in Korea. Korea had spent much of the first half of the 20th century under the colonial rule of the Japanese Empire, and due to the Japanese annexation of the country, the Korean People's Army was founded in the 1930s as a national liberation movement, with communists playing a leading role in this anti-Japanese resistance. Due to this struggle, Korea managed to gain their hard-won independence at the end of World War II, following the withdrawal of Japanese forces, and Kim Il-sung, who was one of the leaders of the anti-Japanese resistance, would then go on to become the elected leader and founder of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in 1948. Following the victory of the Korean People's Army over Imperial Japan, a socialist government was elected into power, and the People's Republic of Korea was declared. The new socialist government began implementing land reforms to begin the process of collectivization. This put Korea well and truly on the path to becoming an independent and a united socialist nation. But this was unfortunately very short-lived, as in a matter of months, the US decided to roll in and further their imperialist geopolitical interests in the Asian Pacific. A partition was enforced along the 38th parallel. This partition split Korea in two, and divided the country between the US-controlled South and the northern half of the country, which was allied with the Soviet Union. In the North, Kim Il-sung continued the land reforms of the original socialist government, which forced landlords and their sympathizers to flee to the South. In the South of Korea, the United States ended up dissolving the socialist government, communists and trade unionists faced repressions, and the Americans decided to hire the help of the Japanese forces who brought nothing but plunder and torture to the Korean people. This forced those in the South who backed the socialist government, as well as those who were veterans of the anti-Japanese resistance, to flee to the North. In the years leading up to the 1950s, lots of border clashes occurred between the North and the South Korean troops along the 38th parallel, and fueled by this division, all-out war broke out in 1950, and it would go down in history as being one of the most major conflicts of the Cold War. To prevent the spread of socialism and the independence of the Korean people, the United States and its allies literally went to town on Korea, with the US forces actually dropping far more bombs during the Korean War than what they dropped in Europe during the entirety of the Second World War. The US bombings left major cities across the country, including the DPRK's capital, Pyongyang, absolutely flattened and obliterated, and a huge proportion of soil and agricultural land was poisoned in the process by these bombings. And because there was so much destruction, one of the biggest complaints made by US pilots in particular was that there was nothing left to bomb. Now, to support the DPRK against the US and its allies, the Soviet Union and China came to the defense, with the USSR providing their support by giving armaments and vehicles to the DPRK forces, whilst China sent reinforcements of infantry on the ground. Now, each side came considerably close to actually winning the war, with North Korea capturing Seoul and much of South Korea, and vice versa, with South Korea and the UN coalition forces getting quite close to the border with China and the Soviet Union. The Chinese the Chinese offensive that provided vital reinforcements to the DPRK was what then managed to push back the coalition forces, and it was back at the 38th parallel where the Korean War came to a stalemate. 
The big break came in April 1953 with Little Switch. Stalin had died in March and Malenkov had taken over. Immediately he launched his worldwide peace offensive and the Chinese agreed unconditionally to General Clark's standing proposal to exchange sick and wounded prisoners. The exchange went smoothly and truce talks were resumed. Encouraged, the world listened for news of the final signing that would mean ceasefire in Korea. What officially ended the Korean War was an armistice in 1953. This is what separated North and South Korea along the 38th parallel once more, but it also placed a demilitarized zone which was created along the border between the two countries. This demilitarized zone, or the DMZ as it's more commonly known as, can still be seen to this day. The United States went on to occupy South Korea and essentially make the South Korean government one of its puppet regimes. US troops remain stationed in South Korea to this day and the sole purpose of this is to threaten and further isolate the North. Unfortunately, a combination of inheriting the underdeveloped semi-feudal conditions of the old society, destructive sanctions from the US and the EU, as well as the dire consequences that the US bombings during the Korean War had on North Korea's agricultural sector, meant that the way that the country was divided after the armistice in 1953 made things very difficult for the DPRK. This was the reason why they were forced to rely quite a bit on imports of resources from the Soviet Union. Union and China. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union, however, these imports were severely affected. A combination of extreme weather conditions, along with sanctions from the United States that were damaging the DPRK's economy, made some very dire conditions arise in the 1990s, as a devastating famine had hit the country under the leadership of Kim Jong-il. With the conditions of the world being dramatically changed as a result of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc being evaporated from existence in 1991, the DPRK found itself standing all alone in the midst of all of the new waves of predatory imperialist wars and attacks that were destroying nations trying to develop independently. It was due to this that North Korea had no choice but to start building up its own defences or be obliterated. So just before you quiver in fear, Whenever you hear about the DPRK strengthening its military or conducting a nuclear missile test, just think about how scary it must be for them to know that just across the border, the US and the South Korean forces engage in annual military exercises which all simulate a full-scale assault on the DPRK. Combine that with the fact that the United States has military bases all around the Asian Pacific to further isolate the DPRK, and it starts to become a lot easier to see why why North Korea, like many other anti-imperialist countries that are literally defying the hegemony of the US empire, is so militarized and literally armed to the teeth. Yet, the United States, who have the most expensive military in the world and one of the biggest arsenals of weapons of mass destruction in the world, has created a propaganda campaign to make us hate the DPRK for essentially just trying to defend themselves from becoming the next Iraq, even going as far as to give some very handsome financial rewards to defectors to steer up some seemingly horrific stories regardless of whether they're true or not. It's totally clear that the monopoly capitalists have the funds and the influence necessary to have shaped our worldviews in order to prevent working people from showing solidarity with the DPRK's ongoing anti-imperialist struggle. So needless to say, my support for the DPRK in their struggle against US imperialism as a result of their country being divided is not unfounded in any way. <laughs>